Good evening, everybody. I just want to mention that we had over 1,500 people signed up for tonight. So I really would like to thank each one of you for coming, and I would like to do it by name. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> but really, thank you very, very, for com very much for coming. I know this was difficult, and we appreciate it. You know, Jews like to argue. It seems hardwired in our genes. Abraham argued with God. Our rabbis squibble with one another so often that they collected their disagreement into the Talmud, which runs more than 6,200 pages. It's a lot of arguments. So we do. We argue about not only about the Talmud and politics, but about the merits of East Side versus the West Side, about whether the corned beef is better, is better at Katz or Second Avenue, and more and more about Israel. Settlements, Bibi, the status of Jerusalem, marriage laws, the two-state solution, Gaza, women in the Western Wall, all have become issues that divide us, clashes that undermine our support for our homeland. So the Stryker Center has proudly partnered with the Israel Policy Forum and the ADL to explore those divisions along generational, political, and religious issues. We are grateful to have such wonderful partners. Before we begin, I would like to mention two events that are coming up uh, on November 28th. Um, I'm sorry, on November 28th, we will discuss the state of moral emergency as we find ourselves as Jews in a country turning its back on immigrants. And on December 7th, for the fifth night of Hanukkah, we will welcome Peter Yero of Peter, Paul, and Mary, who will be on Friday night services performing his iconic song, Light One Candle, doing Shabbat services. But now it's about time to argue. So to begin tonight's program, it is my pleasure to introduce Shelley Parker, a longtime ADL leader and the current co-chair of the ADL International Affairs Committee. Please welcome Shelley Parker. Please welcome Shelley Parker. Good evening. You all deserve medals for being here tonight, so thank you. There's so many people work so hard, and um, you really, it's um, terrific that you came. Um, for those of you that don't know, ADL is an anti-hate organization founded in 1913 to defend the Jewish people and secure justice and fair treatment for all. We are a global leader in fighting anti-Semitism, exposing extremism, and delivering anti-bias education, combating hate crimes online. I just want to tell you about one anti-bias program that we have, and that is No Place for Hate. It's a terrific anti-bias program that in, that's across the country, but in New York City, we are in 185 schools, and we reach over 130,000 students. It is spectacular. ADL has 25 offices around the country and one in Israel. We are on the ground swiftly and consistently responding to acts of anti-Semitism, racism, and bigotry. ADL is the 911 for the Jewish community. Many people ask me, why have I been involved in ADL for over 20 years? And I tell them I can go to sleep at night because I know ADL is awake. ADL advocates for the security and well-being of the Jewish state of Israel and actively supports the two-state solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. We engage in a variety of efforts to counter the Boycott Divestment Sanction, or BDS, movement and other, in, and other international efforts to delegitimize Israel and advocate and educate on issues relating to Israeli democracy, religious pluralism, and bigotry. In recent years, many of the Jewish world have begun asking about the future of the American Jewish support for Israel. How are we to deal with the generational, political, denominational divisions with respect to Israel that threaten our, our, our sense of unity and peoplehood? 
We can't just blame these divisions on the actions of the Israeli government. And we also can't just blame the differences between Republicans and Democrats. The challenges are deeper than these superficial explanations, and it is critical for us to clearly map them out and discuss effective strategies for overcoming them. To explore this in greater detail, the Israeli, the, the Israeli Policy Forum, the Anti-Defamation League, and the Stryker Center have joined together to put together this series of conversations. The first one tonight is dealing with the generational divide, and that's why we're all here tonight. Um, the, future, the future conversations are going to deal with the political and dom denominational issues. Our aim for these panels is to allow us to candidly discuss what divides us, what unites us, and how we can prevent these divisions from hardening and creating inalterable splits. So before I turn the program over to Susie Gelman, Israel Policy Forum's board chair, to introduce tonight's panelists, I would like to just take a brief moment to talk about Pittsburgh, the most deadly anti-Semitic attack in US history. Each of tonight's panelists have written eloquently about the horrific shooting at the Tree of Life Synagogue. One of the major themes emerging from Pittsburgh is a recognition of how American society at large reacted to the murder of 11 innocent Jews. From the amazing heroism of Pittsburgh's law enforcement and their first responders to the thousands and thousands of Americans, clergy of all faiths, Jews and non-Jews alike, all gathered to memorialize and mourn the Tree of Life victims. Happily, th this is a testament to the true spirit of the American people, one of tolerance, inclusivity, and compassion. Let's all pause for a brief moment of silence to commemorate the 11 lives lost at the Tree of Life Synagogue. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Susie Gelman, and I'm honored to serve as board chair of Israel Policy Forum. For those of you who are not yet familiar with our work, Israel Policy Forum seeks to preserve Israel's future as secure, Jewish, and democratic through the two-state solution. Our mission is to educate policymakers, opinion shapers, and Jewish community leaders on the importance of support for pragmatic measures to preserve and advance the goal of an eventual two-state solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, consistent with Israel's security needs. Those security needs were especially apparent with the renewed rocket attacks from Hamas and other terror organizations from the Gaza Strip this week. Our thoughts continue to be with the people of Israel who faced Hamas's indiscriminate attacks, just as our thoughts are also with the innocent civilians in Gaza who are held hostage by the Hamas leadership. At this difficult time for Israel, and for the sake of peace, Israel Policy Forum seeks to elevate the discourse to foster a more informed and constructive dialogue about the challenges and opportunities facing Israel and the pursuit of a lasting peace. Our goal is not only to rally those who are convinced of our positions, but to engage across the divides of our community. That is what this series, which commences this evening, is all about. We're thrilled to partner with the ADL and with the Stryker Center on this important and timely series of conversations. I'm now pleased to introduce tonight's special guests. Frankly, I cannot think of a better panel to discuss the issues impacting the next generation of American Jews than these three journalists who, through their writings, are already shaping our community's thinking about our future relationship with Israel and with each other. Barry Weiss 
is a writer and editor for the New York Times opinion section, where she writes about culture and politics. Before joining the Times, Barry was an op-ed editor at the Wall Street Journal and an associate book review editor there. For two years, she was senior editor at Tablet, the online ma magazine of Jewish news, politics, and culture, where she edited the site's political and news coverage. Barry's recent writings in the wake of the Pittsburgh tragedy, which occurred in her hometown and at the very shul where she herself became a bat mitzvah, have been so important for all of us trying to grapple with this horrific event. And let me add that Barry deserves a hearty kola kavod for her recent description of the scourge of anti-Semitism in her appearance on Bill Maher, which went viral and is well worth seeing. Just Google Barry Weiss, Bill Maher, and pull it up on YouTube. Yair Rosenberg, a longtime friend of both Israel Policy Forum and the ADL, is a senior writer at Tablet Magazine, where he covers the intersection of politics, culture, and religion. His work has appeared in numerous publications and has covered an array of subjects. Through his writings and speaking engagements, Yair has become a leading voice of the next generation when it comes to American Jewry's relationship to Israel and the fight against anti-Semitism in this digital world. And of course, in his spare time, he famously creates bots that troll anti-Semites on Twitter. Dr. Batya Ungar Sargon is the op-ed editor for The Forward. Her work has appeared in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the LA Times, and Foreign Policy. Batya is a prolific writer who has become an influential voice among American Jewish progressives, often writing multiple opinion columns a week in response to breaking news developments impacting the Jewish community, Israel, and American politics. Our moderator this evening is Adina Phillips. Adina is a management consultant who has worked with numerous Fortune 500 companies and leading American Jewish synagogues and institutions, specifically on the issues we're focusing on tonight. She is a board member of Israel Policy Forum and also serves as the national chair of IPF Atid, our growing young professionals network. And I just want to say to all of the stalwart people in this audience who braved the elements to join us here tonight, we were actually oversold for this event. We were going to be more than a full house, so I hope that everyone who didn't make it is live streaming it. But I really want to thank all of you for coming out for what I promise you will be a very insightful, stimulating, and interesting program. Uh, David, are you coming out too? David Halpern is our executive director. I heard that Adina was running late getting into Grand Central, so I don't know if she's here, so I'm going to bring out the panel and Either David Halperin or Adina Phillips or both of them will appear on stage to begin moderating this event. And thank you very much, all of you, for being here. Uh, Adina. Okay. <laughs> So you might have heard I had some stress getting here. And I'm surprised at all of you for looking much more calm than me. But um, I have to say, out of all the stressful elements of the past two and a half hours, comparing Uber to Waze, figuring out which one was lying less, um, you know, getting off, getting a subway, running, the most stressful part for me was actually trying to come up with a metaphor comparison between the chaotic weather and the Middle East and millennials. And I've got- I just need to make a Rothschild <laughs> joke. Yeah. And I've got nothing for you. Okay, just so, for yeah. yeah. Well, I was, I've was. i got nothing for you, that? but- like, we didn't get the Rothschild to control the weather? <laughs> so lucky for us, we have um, a very interesting, entertaining panel, and I think the hardest work for my evening is over. Okay, so I'm gonna jump right in. Before I jump in, um, I just want to let the audience know we're going to have time for question and answer tonight, and your uh, percent chance of getting to ask your question just went up a lot. <laughs> Good. Um, and we also have people viewing us, uh, joining us via live stream, and um, live stream audience, thank you for joining us. You'll have the opportunity to ask questions as well. And we're going to be monitoring social media for those questions, so we ask that you um, Use the hashtag across the divide uh, on Twitter for your questions. 
or post them in the IPF Atid Facebook group. So with that, let's jump right in. So um, this topic that we're here to discuss tonight, um, the divide young American Jews in Israel, something we talk a lot about. Um, and it's something that we talk a lot about now, but that we've been talking about for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. And I was looking for a good data point to start the conversation off with tonight. And I pulled up a 1991 American Jewish Committee focus group on this very issue. And it could have been written yesterday. So my first question for our panel is, is this really a unique moment? What is unique about this moment that we're in? Um, is, it, is it sort of the media overblowing it? Is it just the way we're viewing it? Or is there something really um, unique and different about this moment that we find ourselves in? And just for the first question, we'll just go in order and start with you, Barry. Sure. Um, first of all, thank you guys so much for coming out in this horrendous weather. Um, you know, I was thinking about this, and I, I think what's not new, right, is that young people, and especially young Jews, tend to be liberal. That's just, you know, what's the famous line? If you're not a socialist before the age of 20, you have no heart. If you're still one after the age of 40, you have no mind. Th that's, you know, that's just sort of par for the course, and the Jews are sort of no exception to that. I think what's unique about this current moment is less generational and more the fact that American Jews and Israeli Jews, it seems to me, are in a kind of collision course where we are threatening each other's sort of most basic values. For American Jews, the fact that this government has aligned itself so strongly with the Trump administration presents a huge problem because most American Jews, for whatever they might like about, you know, Nikki Haley at the UN or scuttling the Iran deal or moving the embassy to Jerusalem, American Jews are overwhelmingly opposed to Trump. So what does it mean when the nation state of the Jews is aligned with him? From the Israeli perspective, you have an American Jewish community that, for example, overwhelmingly supported the Iran deal, something that they see as an existential threat. So that's sort of the main conflict that I see, and I see it as less generational and more in terms of sort of threatening each other's values or at least perceived values. Hi, um, it's great to be here. Uh, thank you all so much for coming. When I saw how many people came in a snowstorm to, to hear us talk, I was like, there's no way there are any, that many people interested in hearing me, but then I realized there's definitely that many people who'd come through like hell and high water to argue with Barry and Bacha. <laughs> um, and so, you know, I'll try not to take up too much of your time, and I apologize in advance. This will be turning into a fight club, let's uh, hope. And I'm just going to shrink down into the vent. <laughs> Um, but it's a good question, you know, how much is different, how much is just that we focus on these things over and over again and Jews have the same conversations again and again? Um, I think about it a lot because I speak a lot on college campuses, I just, these past couple weeks I spoke at Duke, I spoke at Ohio State, I, I talk with the kids for a very long time, uh, and, I'm, and I'm not too far removed from that myself, and I have siblings who are, you know, experiencing what's going on for themselves, uh, and I, I find that uh, there is something different. Uh, but it's not so much political as experiential, which is that younger Jews today, as opposed to, say, 20 years ago, are more likely to speak Hebrew, they're more likely to have been to Israel, and they're more likely to relate to it in a more complex and granular way than people for whom it was an abstract symbol that they didn't know with nearly as much detail. They have, people today, young Jews and older Jews, have access to English language sources that are much more diverse and varied um, and detailed uh, online than about what's going on in Israel than what you would have had 20 years ago. Uh, so the way that people relate to Israel is just very, very different and a lot more sophisticated. Um, that often doesn't get captured in media reports, so guilty as well, of uh, you know, sort of the extremes, right? So the extreme voices on one side where you have very, very Zionist students who are feeling very, very, very aggrieved on campuses, and then you have very, very anti-Zionist students who are feeling very, very aggrieved for other reasons. Um, most of the students I meet are not either of those categories. Uh, they're just people sort of muddling their way through a very complex moment in Israel and in America, uh, and they want people to talk to them about that, and very often, though, they see people from the outside, adults from outside, telling them that they need to think about Israel in very simple ways that perhaps were more common 20 years ago. And I'm sure we can talk about that more tonight. So I want to reiterate the thanks to all of you for coming out. Uh, it means a lot to me, and I also wanted to thank uh, the Israel Policy Forum for 
holding on to that two-state solution with everything you've got, uh, despite it becoming more and more difficult, and also have to thank the ADL, um, Jonathan, Batsaida, Todd, all of you. Um, I, I know all, all of us just really, really um, feel the work that you do represents the best of the Jewish community and exactly what we are, which is a civil rights-focused community. So thank you for that, and thank you for having me. Um, I think that the Trump administration has actually, in some ways, um, uh, shrunk the generational divide. And what I mean by that is, so a few days ago, Trump uh, made a kind of crazy statement where somebody asked him about what he's doing uh, in terms of all of the anti-Semitism. And his answer was, what are you talking about? I'm so great on Israel. And this was um, a shocking thing to hear. I mean, all of Twitter went, <gasps> you know, at once. And, um, but in a way, in a way, where did he get that from? I mean, he got that from us, right? I mean, for 50 years, the Jewish American community has outsourced its identity to Israel. It has not focused on what it means to be a Jew in terms of we are a minority community, we have a rich history, we have texts, we have community. It has focused on Israel. What does it mean to be a Jew? It means to be uncritical of Israel and to give unconditional support to Israel. So in a way, I don't really blame Trump. I mean, he was saying the messaging that we have been telegraphing for 50 years and that our young people have reminded us recently, actually, no, actually, we are Jews, we have a diaspora identity. Our diaspora identity is bound up in civil rights. It's bound up in what it means to thrive as a minority in a community where you're not a majority. And I think Israel actually had a lot to do with giving us that strength and giving us that safety here. But at the same time, I think you are seeing that thanks to Trump, the older generation is now acknowledging this. The older generation is now realizing, wait a minute, Trump is not our values. Trump is Netanyahu, so what does that mean about us? What does that mean about who we are? And I think especially after Pittsburgh, when you saw all of these Israeli officials coming out here and gaslighting us and lecturing us and telling us support Trump, even though the American Jewish community felt that it was Trump's fault in a way, what happened to us in Pittsburgh, that was shocking and I think also Again, a kind of wake-up call, especially when you had Muslim communities and black communities showing up for us, mourning with us, supporting us. It was this huge wake-up call. Oh my God, we're a minority community. Our values are civil rights. And well, unfortunately, our this- Our values are other things other than civil rights, Batya. Our values are also the fact that we are alive for the Jewish return to political sovereignty. The idea that we would celebrate that, and the idea that, I'm sorry, it's completely I was in Pittsburgh, I'm from that community. I spent the week there. I was bat mitzvahed in that synagogue. I could not tell you, even, even among the Jews who were showing up for If Not Now and Bend the Ark and protesting Trump, you better believe that they liked the fact that Ron Dermer and Naftali Bennett showed up in the same way that Israeli officials show up after you know, the shooting up of hyper cachet in France. It's sending a message that we are all one Am Yisrael. That has nothing to politicize that, I just think is, is wrong. Um, I don't think I'm politicizing it, I'm pointing out a difference in values. So when Naftali Bennett, who doesn't believe in civil rights, who wants his fantasy of Israel, has an apartheid component to it, where in the West Bank, Palestinians don't have national rights, don't have the right to vote, which I think gives all of us pause, makes us as American Jews go, oh my God, it's a difference of values. It's a question of what does it mean to be a Jew? And I think by and large in Israel, it is an ethnic nationalistic definition, very much in line with what it means for Viktor Orban to be Hungarian and what it means for Trump, by the way, to be an American. It means to have an ethno-nationalist ethno identity. And for American Jews, what it means to be a Jew is to pursue social justice, Olam chasedi bane, tzedek tzedek tirdof, things from our Bible, things we invented 2,000 years ago, by the way. Due process, equality before the law, these are Jewish values, and I think the American Jewish community is waking up to that. So I think we... I, I just want to understand, do you think that supporting Israel is a non-Jewish value? I think 95% of the American Jewish community is pro-Israel. We are all still pro-Israel. 
What we are not is willing to give it unconditional support. That is not to not be pro-Israel. You can be pro-Israel and criticize Israel. That is what it means to be an American Jew. We are no longer willing to give unconditional support. No one said that. No, yeah, so this is, uh, I would like to jump in just to say that I think that that's kind of a canard. Uh, very few Jews historically have ever thought that supporting Israel meant doing it unconditionally. It's mostly people who criticize Israel who accuse Jews of doing that. Um, even the right-wing Jews in our community, remember when we had the disengagement from Gaza, and tons of American Jews on the right came out and said this is a terrible idea. When Oslo happened, um, the right wing called it a diluted peace camp uh, in Israel that is basically, there's a book called the, the, uh, the uh, I think it's called The Oslo Delusion by Kenneth Levin, a Harvard Medical School lecturer, which basically tries to diagnose from afar the Israeli peaceniks who had been elected by the majority of the Israeli public as mentally unstable, right? And this was reviewed in the Jerusalem Post, and it was reviewed in the New Republic, it was treated seriously. The right wing and the left wing in America of the Jewish community, and also the people in the middle, have been critical of Israel for quite some time. How they express that, whether they think that means boycotting settlements or not, whether they think that means being publicly critical or privately critical, these are all things we parse differently. But I think it doesn't stand up to scrutiny that the American Jewish community believes in unconditionally supporting Israel. Um, there's just, I, I agree with that. You know, so I think, exactly, so I think we, like, we define the terms again. I think then we want to get more granular about expressing that qualitative uh, appreciation, but also criticism of Israel and how that's changing and how that might be changing generationally. That's a much more interesting question. Um, but yeah, I, I always, my hackles get up when people say, we're no longer, America should no longer unconditionally support Israel because like the second piece I ever wrote for Tablet, which for I wrote me? as Barry was my editor, was about all of the instances in American history of American presidents taking Israel to the woodshed. And there are a lot of them. And they sort of get memory hold by Jews who don't want to remember them because they like to think of this relationship as being so wonderful and perfect in every way and shared values. And by people who are critical of Israel who want to pretend like Jews exercise maximal power and can stop America from screwing over Israel whenever they want, which isn't true either. Uh, so I, I like to get away from that and talk about it in like a thoughtful way, exactly, that there were, we, which we heard here, different people on the ground in Pittsburgh who had different reactions uh, to the Israeli government. There were a lot of people who were very appreciative. I was there, a lot of tablet staff was there. A lot of people were very appreciative, not of the politics of the particular Israeli officials who showed up, but that an Israeli official showed up and came and spoke and represented and said, you matter to us. And then minimized uh, and, the ADL's work, by the way. And then they didn't appreciate afterwards how on the way out, Naftali Bennett did a tweet storm about how Trump isn't connected in any way to anti-Semitism that we see in America. And American Jews have very diff many different opinions on whether Trump is or isn't. But you know what? They don't think that's Naftali Bennett's job. Just like Israelis turn around and tell Americans all the time, right, you don't live here. There are certain choices and decisions and things that you should not meddle with because after all, it's not your skin in the game. American Jews really do respect that argument very often, and they feel obviously Naftali Bennett needs to respect that just the way back. Um, and I think a lot of what actually raised the hackles of Jews was not so much the particular politics of Bennett, but that he decided to sort of treat us the way he tells us not to treat them. Barry, what's on your mind? <laughs> just the, I'm just thinking about what is a Jewish value and the question of that. I went on Bill Maher and said a lot of things along the lines of what Batya said, but you know what else is a Jewish value? Protecting Jewish lives, being a place of refuge. I'm sorry, like it's not the, the notion that our religion is just liberal values is incomplete. And I think that it's frankly a very shallow understanding of, of, of what a Jewish value is. You mentioned in, what, in your remarks, and then I'm sorry, Adina, I'll go to you, that you know, part of the reason that we've been able to be so open and, and sort of embody the values of welcoming the stranger and all of these things that I treasure as Jewish values, the reason we've been able to do that in this country is frankly not just because America is a unique diaspora for the Jews, it is also because the existence of Israel makes life in communities like Pittsburgh and on the Upper East Side possible. So I think we've, we've got our map for the evening um, and on all of the issues around. that we'll were just around. brought up. And, um, and I want to take some of the nuance that we just teased out and the differences right here um, to college campuses. And I'm interested, yeah, you're in the point you made about um, young Jews having more experiential um, contact with this issue and, and maybe that being one of the reasons for having more of this nuance. And I want to hear some of your thoughts about um, what's going on on college campus. And Barry, I'm going to start with you. You wrote a piece last month um, 
talking about um, Israel's expelling of BDS supporters and making the argument that um, censuring BDS supporters is um, doing more harm than good. And I'm wondering if you could sort of take those um, thoughts, maybe speak to them a little bit and, and share what your view is of what's going on on college campus and what you think you know, is going on or should be happening there in that context. Right. The piece was written by me and Brett Stevens, and we did it purposefully together because we thought the idea of having two sort of outspoken, the two outspoken Zionists of the New York Times weighing in critically on a particular policy would make a difference, and, and it really, really did. Um, we were writing about the case of uh, Laura al Qassam, who is a young woman of Palestinian descent who uh, historically had been a BDS, not even just a BDS supporter, the president of her BDS chapter at her college in Florida, um, but had decided to pursue a master's degree at Hebrew University. And the message of the piece was basically, you know, it telegraphs a weakness in your culture, if in your society, in your country, if you are scared of a 22-year-old student who wants to learn more about the country. Um, we suggested in the piece that those who support policies like BDS should be welcomed into Israel because for all of its warts, and there are many, and I write about them often, um, Israel has a lot to, to say for itself and a lot to be proud of. I'm sure we'll get to the warts later in the conversation. But I don't know, that, that for me was an interesting moment because I really try and be um, really uh, intentional about when I go after uh, a, particular pol a particular Israeli policy, frankly, because the criticism often gets weaponized uh, by those who really, really are cloaking their anti-Zionism, cloaking their real views in the language of anti-Zionism and anti-Israel sentiment, which of course is a lot of what we see on college campuses right now. I'm gonna punt it to you to talk about maybe intersectionality, because I could go on for a while. Really, you two should be arguing about that. I don't really write about it. Well, that's not um, but, but uh, yeah, so college campuses are an interesting question. question. I think in a, lot of, in a lot of respects, the Jewish media has a certain uh, culpability for how they're perceived, which is that, you know, like all media outlets, Jewish media outlets tend to report um, man bites dog stories, as they're called, rather than dog bites man stories. So you're going to hear big, like lots of news coverage about every plane crash, but not about the 10,000 planes that don't crash. Um, on almost all college campuses, there's either no BDS real sentiment um, or there's no real serious anti-Israel movement. It's not really a salient issue on the campus. Um, and that goes in both directions. And then you have on extremes, you have on the one hand, these like places like, say, like Oberlin, uh, where some anti-Semitic stuff happens and where some anti-Zionist stuff happens. And sometimes they overlap, sometimes they don't. Um, and you have, you've all heard these examples probably in certain parts of the Jewish press. And then you have, on the other hand, a place where some wealthy Jewish donor puts his foot down and puts some pressure on a Hillel to shut down a Breaking the Silence event or some J Street U event. Um, and you hear a lot about that, too, from other parts of the Jewish media. Uh, and then if you actually, again, go to most college campuses, the kids are doing just fine. Most of the stuff is not happening to them. It's not a major part of their experience. And they do just, you know, they actually have really good dialogues going on on the campus around these issues, and they handle themselves well. But and I think there's don't, don't a certain paternalism about it but that the media promotes. But don't you think that being, let's say, okay, I'll just say, don't you think that being anti-Israel is becoming a tentpole of the progressive left on college campuses? It's like in the water. Even if there's not an active BDS movement, it's assumed that you'll support Black Lives Matter, you'll support the Women's March, and you'll think that Israel maybe has a right to exist. It's an interesting question. I don't know. It's a good question. I think that a lot of campuses don't have a progressive movement in that sense because a lot of these campuses exist in parts of America that are much more politically diverse than, say, the East Coast bubble or, you know, the places where I think a lot of people like us tend to be, you know, rotating around. So it's absolutely true that, for example, at NYU, a bunch of student groups signed a statement basically saying, we won't partner with Hillel, we won't partner with the ADL, we won't partner with APAC. Like, they put those all in the same box. Um, and they basically just said, you're all a disease contagion, and because you're connected to Israel, we won't talk to you. That's really sick and broken. Um, and I am say that out loud, right? And that happens, and that's real. Uh, but when you go to Ohio State, that isn't happening. Um, and Ohio State's a huge campus, right? When I speak at the University of Washington, it's not happening. When I, you know, so I, I go to a lot of these places, and that's not really what's going on. Um, my younger sister's in Harvard. When I was a student there, the same thing. That there was you know, a serious anti-Israel student presence and a real serious debate on campus at some points, but it was normal, 
as you would expect on a college campus, and you weren't getting students kicked out or mistested and all that. It does happen. It happens, and it happens in particular in certain progressive spaces, and it should be called out. Uh, but it's different. I think we, there are thousands of, there's so many campuses, and I think we often, again, because the media highlights the most extreme cases, because that's what we're here to do, right? And that's what makes the most interesting story. Just like the anti-Zionist Jew is way more fun to interview than the middle-of-the-road liberal Zionist who supports a two-state solution but is somewhat critical of Bibi, but also thinks that a lot of the criticism of Israel is overblown and comes from a bad place. That person's that's not an interesting Rosen, interviewer. That's me. <laughs> right? That's what I spend my time on Twitter trying to make interesting, right? Which is a much harder sell than saying, I'm a Jew and I want Israel gone, right? Or I'm a Jew and I think that the, you know, the Palestinians are the new Nazis, right? Right? Those people give great quotes. Right? Those people make great op-eds that get a lot of people angry, that get a lot of clicks, so let's not kid ourselves. That's a part of the business model. Right? And it's priced in. It's not necessarily what's healthy for the discourse. It doesn't necessarily represent the majority of people, whether they're kids on college campuses or the people in this room. Um, certainly not in my experience. Man, you just made me so happy out here. <laughs> That's great news. <laughs> so, but, uh, which doesn't mean that there aren't things to worry about, which is why it's worth writing about all of those things. It's not good when a oh, oh, donor steps on an, a Jewish organization, whether a campus or otherwise, and stops something that they see as too critical of Israel, right? It's not good when campus groups try to kick out Zionists, whether they're progressive or otherwise. Um, and it's not good when, you know, a group like, say, Jewish Voice for Peace gives those people cover with the Jewish name, right? Those things are all not great. But I also think that we have to recognize that there's more of, I think, the sensible middle than there are a lot of those voices. Um, and just because they're very loud on social media sometimes and because they can get a lot of hate reads online shouldn't allow them to be mistaken for, as Batya said, 95%, and I think there's actually, we have a statistic, um, because J Street actually was pushing around this study. They didn't do it, but they were pushing it around. The Melman Group did a poll, and they found that 92% of Amer American Jews identify as pro-Israel. So keep that in mind when you see the next article saying that, oh my God, they've lost all of the young Jews, right? It's, it's not true. It's just the poll also found that lots of American Jews think them themselves as pro-Israel, and also harbor some criticisms of the Israeli government, which makes total sense, because that's most of us with our own government at any given time. And of course, it would be true of Israel as well. So yeah, Ir, um, this sensible middle that you're talking about is probably the group that's facing questions around intersectionality the most. Um, and by, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on that, and especially um, was very interested in your, your recent comments about the election um, and might have the headline of your article here, women of color who criticize Israel one big, that's good for American Jews. Um, so you can share with us a little bit more um, your thoughts on intersectionality and how we should be navigating those waters. I would say that on the question of intersectionality, the part of the self of me that is a Jew is a little at war with the self of me that is a journalist. So as a journalist, looking at this movement. I've written very critically of it. I've written that, you know, when we come into the public sphere, we should be coming into the public sphere as equals. And, you know, equality is not a natural concept, you know? Equality is something we invent in order to exist in a democracy. And so when we, you know, identity politics, when it insists upon the the, what makes us different from each other instead of what makes us equal and the same, I don't think that that is going to be a winning strategy for minorities in this country who do not have civil rights. So as a tactic, I don't think identity politics and intersectionality um, are useful. And certainly, I feel as a Jew, you know, I feel very much when other Jews feel rejected by intersectional movements for their Zionism. At the same time, my Judaism and my Jewish values are about fighting for racial equality. I mean, that to me is sort of what the Jewish mandate in America is. Um, you know, I mean, I go to synagogue every week, so there's other parts to it. And again, as I said before, I think Israel contributed a lot to our safety here, but as Jews in America, we are essentially the symbol of, we are the promise of liberal democracy fulfilled, right? We are the proof that you can be a minority and not only have equality to your Christian neighbors, but actually be cherished, actually be 
just really beloved, so beloved that cops will throw themselves in the line of fire in order to protect us, right? We are the promise of liberal democracy fulfilled, so it is really our job to make sure that other minorities in this country have those same rights, which I believe they do not, especially African Americans, Muslims, Latinos. Um, in terms of intersectionality, what that means is, is that as a Jew, I find myself wanting to be in the company of the people who are fighting for racial justice. That's where my Jewish soul takes me. But at the same time, I have a lot of questions. I mean, you know, what's going on with the Women's March is very problematic. At the same time, I'm not willing to throw it out because they are fighting for racial justice and that is what it means to be a Jew to me. So I have a lot of questions here. And, um, in but in terms of the three women who were elected to Congress, I really did feel that, especially after Pittsburgh, seeing how the Muslim community and the black community stood up for us and reminded us who we are, that we are all minorities in this great nation, there was a part of me that really f sat up and said, oh yes, that's what we are. We are a minority here and our lot is with other minorities. And as such, it, it, we cannot help but be overjoyed to see women of color rising up into positions of power. Now these women, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, Rashida Tlaib, and Ilhan Omar have all criticized Israel. But again, I think that that is also part of what makes it good for American Jews. Now, I'm putting aside Ilhan Omar's tweet about Israel having hypnotized the world. I find that to be actually um, um, uh, anti-Semitic, and I wish she would address it. I think it was probably, uh, you know, in error. Um, I've been, you know, reaching out to her office, asking her to address this many times. She has not. Hopefully, it will happen. Um, but. But I think for progressive women of color, minorities, to criticize Israel on legitimate grounds is not a bad thing. Again, that's where we are at as a community. We criticize Israel on legitimate grounds. And now, the, to come back to intersectionality, I'll just end with this. Like, how are those movements going to know the difference between legitimate and illegitimate grounds if there are no Jews in them? Like, who is going to explain to Ilhan Omar that it's okay to say Israel has deprived Palestinians of civil rights and it must stop, but it's not okay to say Israel has hypnotized the world? Who's going to explain that to her if all the Jews get up and walk away? So that's sort of, you know, I feel called upon to be in those spaces making those comments. And th these are not spaces where you can't argue. They, they are spaces, I would say, where you can't show up and be pro-Israel and be a Zionist and not expect to have a conversation about that. But at the same time, it is simply the case that what Israel is doing in the West Bank is utterly unacceptable to anybody who values democracy. So why should we expect to show up in lefty spaces and not have to answer for that? If we're saying, I support Israel, why should we have to show up and there be an expectation that we not be asked about that? That's what I don't understand. Let's go and have those conversations. I would quickly just say that soft, often when Jews show up in those spaces, they are interrogated when there is no connection to Israel, that, simply for being problem. Jewish. If I showed up that's with the Amica, exactly. So the issue is, again, so that is fine. If people want to have a conversation 100%. about your stated political views, 100%. that's great. On Twitter, because I have a Jewish name, my opinions are often very quickly assumed uh, and very much almost always in error. Um, and so that's, and that's what I think worries people. And to say, I agree, Jews should always be in the room, especially in these movements. Um, but often we're being pushed out. You show up with a pride flag with a Jewish star and people are saying it's an Israeli star. It's not. That's Any terrible, more yes. than that, that star was a sheriff star that Trump pretended <laughs> totally. was one. Well, right? just, and these are sorts of games that people play where they tell Jews and they gaslight them and they tell them your symbols don't mean the things you say they are. Right? And they do it all over the map and say, oh, actually, it's only the other people who do it. Um, I, I liked a lot of what... Yeah, sorry. Yeah, I, just wanna, I wanted to say... Barry has much more to say on this. Barry and Bacha have both written, they're not going to say this because they're not going to plug themselves, but Bacha wrote a really great, interesting critique of intersectionality, which is sort of intersectionality has failed us. What's the second half of the title? Should Jews abandon intersectionality. Should Jews abandon intersectionality. And Barry wrote a whole thing on the Women's March and intersectionality for the New York Times. And so I encourage people to read it, and maybe Barry will talk Actually, about yeah, it. Actually, I'm going to ask you to say one more thing, even though you're just funding it to the others because you're talking about um, walking into that room and facing anti-Semitism. And I just want you to tease out a little bit more um, how you view anti-Semitism from the left you know, versus anti-Semitism from the right. Are these different animals, are they the same animal? Do they need to be addressed differently? Should we be distinguishing them? 
I've written a lot about anti-Semitism. It's hard to distill it into a soundbite. Um, I like to say that uh, the most debilitating argument we have over anti-Semitism is whether or not it's a left-wing or a right-wing problem, uh, because the only people who ever win that argument are the anti-Semites themselves, who continue being anti-Semites, while we, their ostensible opponents, just point fingers at each other. Um, but there's a real reason that debate keeps happening, and it's because it's so much easier to call out bigotry and prejudice, not just anti-Semitism, among people you already disagree with on everything else, and therefore it's politically advantageous to you to find these other things and talk about them. But it's not so easy to have that conversation with your friends and allies Ironically, the people who might actually listen to you if you had that hard conversation, unlike your enemies who will definitely not listen to you and might actually get defensive about their anti-Semitism, which might not have been intentional, but they'll suddenly start defending it because they see it coming from an enemy or an outsider. Um, the place where you can effectively fight anti-Semitism is wherever you are. So if you exist in a left-wing space, that's where you've got to fight it because you're not going to convince somebody in the young Republicans on campus to like really start going after those old right people. They're not going to listen to you. They're going to laugh you out of the room. And the same thing is true if you're, a, you know, one of those young Republicans and you go and walk in to the, you know, the intersectional feminist club and start talking to them about, you know, kicking Zionists out of your spaces, right, or assuming Jewish views on Israel just because you see them. Um, and like, they're going to laugh and they're going to get defensive when they might not have if someone in their own room spoke up and was the person in the room and did that. Um, I, to bring it back to intersectionality quickly, both Bacha and Barry have criticized intersectionality. I don't think I've really written on it, um, so I'm going to defend intersectionality for a second. Um, I want to take a step back and explain very quickly what it is for those who don't know the theory so well. So intersectionality is this uh, very interesting way of identifying um, forms of oppression in society that might have otherwise been overlooked. Think of it more like a lens. Um, it's a particular theorist uh, named uh, Kimberly Crenshaw, um, who's at Columbia, um, among other institutions. And she wrote about it in the context of black women uh, who worked in a particular, uh, particular profession and who experienced particular forms of discrimination that say white women who also experienced forms of oppression were not experiencing. So the, the fact that they were the, this intersection of being black and being a woman, they were being treated differently and experiencing their lives differently than someone who was just a woman, right, or just black, and say a black man. Um, and that actually is a really useful insight for seeing forms of oppression that we might overlook or ways of being in the world that we might overlook. Um, and the way I see it is a really great thing that this can illuminate is, for example, white Jews who experience anti-Semitism, who are both white and therefore can pass and attain certain privileges and are not going to get pulled over by the police, right, and are not going to be discriminated against in certain employment situations. But on the other hand, they're also the only white group that anti-Semites who are white supremacists don't think are white and will try to kill and shoot up in synagogues. Um, and intersectionality could really help illuminate this conversation. That conversation doesn't happen in intersectional spaces right now. Intersectionality is not applied to Jews. So I think it's actually a really useful hermeneutic that is largely not used to its full potential to illuminate things like anti-Semitism. There are really cool people like Berkeley's David Traub who have written academic stuff on this. There are people who are trying to broach that conversation. But in the end, they have to be willing in progressive spaces to have that conversation. And I haven't seen so much willingness yet. Um, and that leads Jews sometimes to get very defensive and very upset about intersectionality. But I don't think the problem, if you read it, is the theory. Yeah, but right? it's I how think, it functions. It I know, functions so there is like a, a real caste critique. system. In practice, however, right, there's a lot to critique about it. Um, so th that, that's where I sort of, like Bach, I'm of two minds, because I can empathize with the theory, but in practice, the way I see it, it gets basically used uh, to... There's a lot of throat clearing for something that is mm -hmm. so obviously acting against Jewish interest, at least at the moment. Jews do not have a place in the intersectional caste system. They are too privileged, period. They're white and they're privileged. There's not a space for them in the exact same way, the mirror image on the alt-right, which is that we are the bottom of that caste system. You, you know what I'm saying? Like, there's no space for us in either of these new rubrics, which is why we're getting squeezed so hard from both sides right now. I, I actually, that's, I, I don't think that's accurate. I mean, where do you see an example of an intersectional movement where... Give me an example. Well, okay, for example, Linda Sarsour spent the last two weeks raising money and touring the, the country looking you know, at Jewish synagogues. Okay, maybe you don't example. like her, we all have problems with her, but she spent all week standing up for Jews. Like, you can't take that away from her. She spent all week in synagogues. So you can't rest say, my case. you can't say, um, okay, we, I, yes. We're gonna be collecting this, index cards in I about totally 10 minutes. I totally understand where you're coming from. 
But I do want to say, if you want to say that there's no place for Jews in the intersectional movement, that's just false because they are making overtures. They may not be making no, the overtures that we specifically have asked them to or want them to, but they are trying, again, I'm with you, not doing the right things, not doing enough. But to say that there, it, this is not happening is simply false. It's happening if you check your particular Jewish identity at the door. That's how it's happening. That's just, I mean, how can you check your identity at the door if you're in a synagogue? Like, that makes no sense. How do you do that? What are you talking about? We're talking about intersectional But she went into movements. synagogues with her followers in order to raise money for Jews. How do you check your... How do you do that in a synagogue? Sorry, sorry, Linda Sarsour. Sorry, I'm so sorry. I'm I sorry, thank like, you. I thank you. <laughs> I just want to pick up on one thing, which is that I think as um, Jews, because of, because of the fact that historically the most horrific anti-Semitism has come from the far right, we have, we're very, very good at being able to call it out because it is, obvious because it has echoes of Nazism, you know, for all of those reasons. I'm hearing a little bit from you like this bending over backwards to not see it when it's so clear on the left. The idea that Ilhan Omar sent that in error, think about that logic applied to very fine people on both sides after Charlottesville, which is frankly much more an, of an ambiguous statement than people, I forget what she said, people are hypnotized and may Allah help them to, you know, they're hypnotized by Israel. Why are you giving, like, why that generosity toward the left when it's so obviously malicious? I mean, I'm not gonna defend a statement that I literally just called anti-Semitic, so I, mean, I don't you, see you why assume, I'm- like, No, but you gave the benefit of the doubt. You said, I'm sure she sent it in error. Because she supports a two-state solution, so, like, like, she's got my politics on Israel. I don't know, like, why that's... Like, she's got my politics on Israel, and she said an anti-Semitic thing about Israel. You I'm just, sorry? No, she didn't. Gonna, she did not. We're going to open she five different questions after. So. No, it's the same person, but she, she supported BDS. She still supports a two-state solution. Thank all Baya, I'm, all Baya, I'm trying thank to... You, Baya, thank you for bringing up the two-state oh, solution. That's Israel Policy Forum's favorite <laughs> topic. So I'm going to use that as our that's portal to move to that. Exactly. Um... So shifting, I know, that, I know we just touched on a very hot topic that we could probably spend the rest of the evening talking about, but I'll, I'll leave that for the audience to pick up for us in a few minutes. Um, I want to talk about the two-state solution for a few minutes. And looking at um, this growing divide um, and, and um, especially some of the issues you're bringing up around intersectionality and thinking about um, young Jews today, um, who have never known a prime minister other than Bibi Netanyahu and who um, haven't, you know, really in their, let's say, mature life um, lived through, um, uh, you know, a hopeful time, direct bilateral negotiations. It's been a long time since any of that has happened. Um, what impact has this had on the prospects for young Jews supporting a two-state solution? Um, is that still... Do you still view that as something that young Jews can hold on to that will be part of the discourse for this generation? Um, I can speak to that. Um, so I think that this whole outsourcing our identity to Israel started after the Six Day War. I think what happened was before that, American Jews were still sort of like, you know, they would like, they still couldn't get into country clubs. They were still sort of like a hated minority in America and saw themselves that way as these sort of like weak, stooped, you know, like they could still see that image reflected at them from wasps, you know? And then there was the Six Day War and suddenly it was like, oh my gosh, we had this like really, really strong, cool cousin, you know? And it was like, if you beat me up, my cousin is gonna come over here and mess you up, you know? And it was like, it gave us back something that we didn't have for millennia, which is national pride. Suddenly Jews were proud. It's like we had this thing to be proud of. And I think that that actually, like I'm very grateful to Israel for that because I think that that really did help elevate us in this country into this sort of cherished minority and, and helped us, you know, really achieve like just beyond equality. Um, what happened was is, is the younger generation has now sort of grown up, not, you know, under the, you know, the glossy, you know, the shine of that military success, but in the shadow of the occupation that came about because of it. And so instead of pride, they look at Israel and they see shame. And I think that that has had a very deep and 
a deep impact on our community. Um, in terms of the two-state solution, I don't feel that I am a stakeholder in Israel's political configuration. I do not vote there. Um, and I could potentially, I could make Aliyah, but right now I am not a stakeholder. It is not up to me whether it is a one state solution or a two state solution. But I think that saying I support a two state solution is shorthand for saying I support self determination for Jews and self determination for Palestinians. As far as I'm concerned, that is the only moral position. I'm sure all of us and everyone in this room wants that and believes in that. I think there are people like Rashida Talib who honestly want that and think you can have that in a one state solution, okay? We can disagree about that. I know a lot of Jews see in the one state solution, oh my gosh, that's the end of self-determination for Jews. Maybe, maybe not, that, that's not shorthand for that. But to me, saying I support a two state solution is saying I, shorthand for everyone uh, deserves civil rights, self-determination, Palestinians and Jews, and that's what I wanna hear my elected officials saying. I agree with a lot of what Batya just said. So uh, there's that. I, I do think that the, the chasm between Israel's highest ideals and its reality, you know, which is you know, anyone who's been to the West Bank, you know, the ongoing occupation of another people controlling millions of lives, I just th see that as absolutely untenable situation. I also think that this sort of growing, I might write about this, but this, the idea that Israel is coming to symbolize um, the nationalism of people like Steve Bannon, of people like Viktor Orban, the new president of Brazil. We don't want an Israel that's beloved by crypto or actual fascists. That's not what we want. Say one thing about the two-state solution, uh, which is not necessarily just about American Jews. Uh, there's a lot of pessimism about the two-state solution, uh, as you said, because there haven't been bilateral negotiations. Um, there's sort of lack of hope. There's a lack of actual actors leading the Israelis and the Palestinians who seem at all interested in it. Um, but the thing is, and this is when people ask me, do I support two states or one state? This is not necessarily the Israel Policy Forum answer. I'm going to say like, two-state solution or bust, right? I'm like, it's at my core. It must be, right? I could, in theory, see, and there are people I have met, both Palestinian and Israeli, who I think could build a beautiful one-state solution that would have true respect for the cultures, histories, and values of both of those communities and could be an incredible project. In practice, though, most Israelis and Palestinians are not those people, and very understandably so, given their history. And the thing is, is that it's amazing, because we have a lot of good polling about Israelis and Palestinians have a two-state solution, and that's what you hear about a lot, is that a slim majority still support a two-state solution. I find that interesting, but the real thing that is telling is that in every poll, the only thing that Israelis and Palestinians consistently agree on is how much they hate the one-state solution. So you get like upwards of 70, 80, 90 percent, depending on how you ask the question, say, absolutely not, do I want to move in with those people, right? Because they've been trying to get divorced for a really long time. Um, and just they cannot agree on the terms. Uh, but this is something that they categorically agree on. And I think there's something, frankly, imperialistic about Westerners, including Western leftists, who then show up and parachute in and say, actually, we know better, and we're going to force you all against your stated preferences and every opinion poll for decades to live together in the same states with the people you believe want to kill you and destroy your national identity. Right? So like, it's just a new form of like, revised intellectual arrogance that then gets applied to the Middle East by people who think they know better. Right? And so I say, listen to the people. And if, by the way, those polls in 10 years say the opposite, and that 76% of Israelis and Palestinians now have the trust in each other and their communities right, to build a one state together, then I think that would be great. And I think that there are some people who I know who want to build that reality and are working to build that sort of trust. They're one-staters, and they recognize without that trust, you're not going to get there. But the people who want to impose a one state from the top down, also known as the leaders of the BDS movement, they're not actually interested in that outcome. They're interested in being armchair avengers for history and replacing a Jewish state with a non-Jewish state, one oppression with another oppression, and I have no interest in that. So, so I'm gonna ask a last question for our, of each of our panelists before we move to questions from the audience. Um, and we've talked in the short time that we've had, we've talked a lot about the divide and I want to hear from each of you, what can be done to bridge this divide, to cross this divide? Where are the bright spots? Where, where is the hope? What are, what are the practical things um, that we can be doing to um, continue to cross the divide? I'm not starting. <laughs> you want the last word. We're going to give Barry the last word. Well, She's had a hard few weeks. Answer. I don't think I've had a good answer. Bye, yeah. 
Um, I would say, <laughs> when they asked us to prepare for this question, they phrased it a little differently. They said, what would you want to convey to the audience in terms of like going forward? And I'm going to answer that because I thought a lot That's about it. Like the oldest trick in the book know, is to just I'm say sorry. what you want to say. I just wanted you guys to know why I wasn't answering that question in case anybody's paying attention. Um, the thing I, I, in case, you know, somebody's paying attention. Oh, paying attention. Um, the thing that I had prepared to say, I think you said call to action. They did. They did. Call to action. So my call to action <laughs> to you would be this. Um, we're stuck with this problem. It's not going anywhere. That's actually very exciting. Um, I would say the most important thing when dealing with a generational divide or people who disagree with you or your Thanksgiving crazy uncle or your children who are maybe becoming crazy lefties and scaring you, um, whatever it is, um, I would say the most important thing, and again, this is Jewish value, um, approach the opinions of people you disagree with with compassion. Find people, thank you. Find people on both sides who you can trust. Follow Isa Amro from Hebron. Follow Yoram Chazoni. Find people who are on the far right and the far left who are worthy of your respect, and they will help you feel compassion for people who say things that you think are nuts. It is not a mitzvah to get crazy angry about other people's opinions. We're all sort of advocates here for what we think are the right thing to think about this topic, and I would say, Stop being obsessed with having your say and expressing yourself and become obsessed with being a persuader. Become obsessed with figuring out how to change people's minds. And a lot of that is listening. And a lot of that is compassion, is thinking, why do they think that? How do I get into their head? I'm a little biased because I'm an opinion editor, so I spend all day trying to make the opinions of people you disagree with palatable to you. Um, but I would say that that, I think, is especially in this topic where people are so passionate for all the right reasons, as Barry said, you know, because we're all Jews, approach the opinions of people you disagree with with compassion. I would second everything Bar um, that Bacha just said. Um, and uh, along the very similar lines, um, I think it's to remember that the loudest and most extreme voices on this issue and on many other issues in America are not actually, this is not a Pollyannish thing, are not actually the majority of the voices on the issue. Those are just the voices that get the most retweets that carry the loudest because they're shouted the loudest. Um, but there's very often many more people struggling through the issue like you and think they're the only ones. That happens to me every single time I go and speak on a college campus, at a conference, anywhere. I wrote this piece about the... Um, protests on the Gaza border called 13 Inconvenient Truths. Oh, so good. Um, you should all read that. 13 Inconvenient Truths. About it's what's the only thing you Israel ever have to read about Gaza is yet years peace. 13 Inconvenient Truths. I'm tell it's, it's just incredible. Please read it. And so, I mean, maybe many of you in this room have read it, maybe not. Uh, but what the thing about the piece is that I wrote it and I thought, oh, this is going to be a disaster because part of it is going to be hated by, you know, one half of the crowd and the other half will be hated by the other half of the crowd and they'll all just spend the next couple of days yelling at me. And that, that's what I thought was going to happen. And I really genuinely believed it. Um, and then I actually put it out and the reaction wasn't, I thought it would be like, you know, really, to be honest, like 25 really angry, 25 really angry, and maybe 50 if I'm lucky who get it. And it was much more like 80, 10, 10. Um, and every single time I tackle a controversial show, it's not just about Israel. And you make the effort, like what you said, to treat the opinions of people you disagree with with compassion. It doesn't mean you end up agreeing with them, but you try to understand them and to represent them and then come to an honest accounting after them. Um, you discover that many, many more people are in that space with you than you thought. Um, and I think our society needs that. And it needs us to remember that. It might mean getting a little bit off Twitter. It might mean getting a little bit off Facebook for your politics and having more conversations with real people face to face. Um, that sort of thing, and this is true if you're trying to solve the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, which is again, your hashtags are not gonna solve it, right? You're putting pressure on this or that donor to make the speeches in whatever venue, more pro-Israel or less pro-Israel, not gonna solve it, right? Having actual relationships with people on the ground in Israel and Palestine who actually trust and believe in each other and wanna work through these issues, that's what's gonna solve it. 
Um, and so to me, that is the most important thing. Um, there are organizations out there interested in this. Some of them are, called, are here in this room, the ADL, the Israel Policy Forum, in different ways are involved in that work. There's an organization called the Alliance for Middle East Peace, which supports a ton of organizations that do things like this. To be honest, uh, people like me in the Jewish media ought to write articles more about these sorts of groups. They're not as sexy. They're harder to, get, to go viral. Uh, but what they do is so much more important for the future long-term solutions right, than the sort of uh, screaming matches we tend to have. Um, a few things. I would say that we spend w an inordinate amount of time and energy in our community on things like Sabra hummus boycotts and the latest JVP rally with 25 people than we do on sort of nurturing and affirming and building our positive identity. And I, that's where my focus is. I, especially, um, you know, I've been thinking a lot about things that seem basic that, that right now feel kind of radical in our community, which are values like Ahavat Yisrael and living those out. Values like, you know, I read this really beautiful thing where um, the mentor of my mentor, my mentor is Yossi Klein Halevi, and his mentor was the sort of organizer of the grassroots movement to free Soviet Jewry, Yaakov, I'm forgetting his last name. And he uh, identified himself not as an Orthodox Jew, not as a Reform Jew, not as a conservative, not as a just Jewish, but as a Klal Yisrael Jew, the kind of Jew that cares about the safety and thriving of Jews all over the world. And that, for me, is one of the most resonant sort of messages in the wake of um, my community's the attack on my community in Pittsburgh, and, and one that I'm hoping to just embody more in my life, and maybe you guys want to do that too. Great, thank you. And um, Barry, your, your last comment actually dovetails perfectly into a question we got from Arie on Twitter. Um, you, you were, you're talking about cultivating positive Jewish identity, and um, Naftali Bennett, and the question doesn't say this, but I know Bibi Netanyahu too, um, has claimed that, um, well, I'll read the question. Okay. Um, Naftali Bennett has claimed young diaspora Jews are disaffected with Israel because of a lack of adequate Jewish education. Do you think their level of education impacts their opinions on Israel? Yes, but it can go both ways. I can't tell you the number of Jews that I know who grew up going to some of the most tony and expensive and celebrated Orthodox Jewish day schools in this country and had never heard the phrase occupation and then got to a college campus and were disaffected is an understatement. So it really matters the kind of, um, the kind of Jewish education people are getting. Um, and I think that there's, uh, there's people way smarter than me that have sort of focused on this, like when to start giving people a more nuanced and complicated, which it is, um, explanation of what's actually going on on the ground there so that when you get to a college campus and you have a professor saying that Israel is the last standing bastion of white colonialism in the Middle East, you have somewhat of an idea of how to respond to that person. So I think that that, that being giving, um, I don't think it's a lack of understanding, I think it's a lack of uh, deep sophistication and um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Great, and I'm, I'm gonna see if the other panelists wanna to respond to the question, and just to tease it out a little more, um, what I see is almost a debate between, like, where is this disengagement coming from? Is it coming from people being displeased right. with, you know, the political situation in Israel, or is it coming from the fact that, well, they're just not connected to their Judaism? And the Jewish Agency and, and um, you know, the Ministry of Education in Israel has a choice of where to put their resources when they're trying to strengthen ties between young Americans and Israel. And I think what we're seeing when Bennett makes these claims is, oh, well, the issue isn't that we have to strengthen ties so that people understand the political situation more and can speak to it, but let's strengthen ties by strengthening their Judaism and their connection to their Jewish education. And so I'm curious if you have a view on that. Yeah, there is this you know, debate. It ties into debates in America and American Jewry over intermarriage as well. Um, are Jews in disengaging from Israel, and I don't think, first of all, Jews are disengaging from Israel, but to the extent that they are, 
Um, is it because of Israel's politics, or is it because American Jews are assimilated and have less Jewish identity and therefore just don't care that much as much about Israel as they might have before? Uh, and that's how it usually gets phrased. Um, we actually have a lot of good data on this. Uh, so it's, it's interesting. We consistently debate it, but like they've studied it very well. Um, and so people might remember when uh, Peter Barnett wrote this, at the time, very uh, controversial essay for the New York Review of Books, uh, his first like major entry into this subject, where he said young Jews are liberal and young Jews are uh, you know brought up in these pro environments and they're being asked to check their liberalism at the door and they're not going to do it and they're getting disaffected by Israel's right-wing policies. Uh, and then lots of people responded to that and the sociologists responded and they said, we have data and it shows that a lot of Jews are just disengaged from Israel because they're largely disengaged from Jewish life in general because they're largely assimilated and happy about it. Um, and then there might be a small group that that's not so, um, where they're really actually super engaged in Jewish stuff and they're super troubled by what's going on in Israel. But it's a much smaller group and to speak of these as the same groups and to conflate them is misleading. And so Peter then wrote a book called The Crisis of Zionism and if you read it, he accepted that criticism and it has two parts. And one part is about the Jews who are disaffected by Israeli policies and what you should do about that and his answer to that is boycott the settlements in that book. Right? And the other half, which no one remembers and no one paid any attention to, was him saying, and then there are lots and lots of Jews who are disaffected from Israel because they're actually just disaffected from Judaism. And therefore, Peter said, even though I'm a liberal, we should support school vouchers to support Jewish education, which is an interesting proposal, um, which I would think is not the right solution to this issue. But the point being is that these are two things that coexist. And people setting them up as a debate are really, again, I think, trying to avoid dealing with the one they don't want to deal with. Right, when really they're both two phenomena happening in our community at different groups of people. Um, I don't know, do you need like Hebrew skills to understand that an occupation is happening in the West Bank? I don't really understand that argument at all. Like, there's no amount of educating that could make that okay to American Jews, I don't think, and to American young Jews that I know. You know, they want us to feel better about our support for Israel, which is there, but is critical. Like, and the occupation, Why don't, wasn't the Jewish agency put all of its money into pressuring the Israeli government to stop occupying Palestinians? And we really have a lot less of a problem. So I have to, that's the first thing. I think the, the Jewish thing. agency people in this room were like, if only we had that kind of money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you would okay. like to donate, they will be taking your donations after. The second point that's I want to make is, um, is, this is called diaspora shaming, okay? This is not the first kind of diaspora shaming. Usually it's like assimilation. They're like, well, you guys are going to be totally assimilated in three generations, so you don't get to have a say on this topic. That's the thing I'm sure everybody here has heard. It's diaspora shaming. It is exactly on a par with all the stuff Max Nordau wrote originally, one of the like fathers of Zionism, all this stuff about how diaspora is this sort of crippled version of Judaism and we need muskel yudin, we need strong Jews to like take over Israel. They're always finding new ways to shame us, assimilation, oh, you don't speak Hebrew, so how could you pass, this is what's making you disconnected from Israel is the lack of Hebrew. As if this language is the thing that's making it hard for us to identify with something that everybody objectively knows is a problem. Don't allow them to shame us. Don't allow them to shame you. Don't allow them to call you anti-Israel if you criticize Israel. You know who you are, you know what you are. But this is a trope and this is gonna come up in many different ways. I actually think that more Jewish education in Jewish schools would lead to less identification with Israel. Because like I said before, like for 50 years we kind of outsourced our Jewish identity to Israel. It's true, we should all be speaking Hebrew. We should all be reading in Aramaic. We have these amazing texts. We should be teaching our children to read our texts and to read our heritage. But I don't see how that's going to make us connected to an ethno-nationalist state that is actually secular. Like that's, I, I really don't see how that is going to be the... I mean, I, we could debate yeah. the specifics of it. It's more just that there's actually sociological data that shows that Jewish education correlates with support for Israel. Well, the way that it's been certain, done. The way so that like it's the Pew been report, done. The Pew report found, right, so that modern Orthodox communities, for example, have high levels of Jewish ritual observance, high levels of Jewish education, high levels of Zionism. But, that, but right? that's because and of the so, way they've been doing the teaching. And so, but but the, yeah. you were saying no yes, level yes, of yes, Jewish yes, education. Yes, it depends yes. what you're teaching and why and all sorts of other questions. But yeah, no, obviously, what sort of education is what matters. And I, I think you're both getting at something which is important, which is when people talk about 
a lack of sort of Jewish education. Like Jews should know Hebrew to be able to understand the amazing things that are happening in Jewish culture right now in Israel, right? The revival of the Mizrahi music tradition and PU team and all sorts of things like that. There's so many things you can learn if you speak Hebrew. But you know what? Israelis should also have a clue about American Jews beyond the fact that they're a piggy bank, right? And that they have money, right? And a lot of Israeli oh, Jews don't actually know what it's like to be an American Jew. They don't really understand, right? And this is not, again, they don't resent, say, conservative, reform, or even modern Orthodox Judaism, but they don't know what it is, right? Yeah. And so if, we're going to be, if they're going to ask, and this comes back to what Bennett does all the time, which is he asks diaspora Jews to do something which he does not do himself. And what we should right? ask them so, to do, given the amount of, you know, given the amount of financial support, not to mention political support that American Jews have given Israel, the least they could do is abolish the rabbinate as one way for us to... Can everyone ties. stay for another hour? We're, we're going to start a new panel on, and on pluralism after this. Um, I'm going to... You're, you're actually touching on one of the questions from the audience, and we only have a couple minutes left. So I'm actually going to read two audience questions and then just ask each of you to speak to whatever... You, moves you um, as your closing remarks, okay? So these are two from our audience here. Uh, one, what do you think about the gap between young Jewish Americans and young Jewish Israelis, which you were just discussing? For example, as an Israeli, I think most Israelis support Trump while American Jews don't. That's the first question. And the second one, shifting gears completely, um, why do critics of Israel like newly elected Congress people never acknowledge that the Palestinians have voted in corrupt leaders who have done nothing to help their own people. So with those two meaty questions, I'll ask you each to make your closing seconds, remarks. Everyone. You go first. I want to see how fast you I, I can talk really, really fast. So <laughs> Here, we know that. <laughs> should be really fine. Um, so American and Israeli Jews, yeah. So I find this very interesting that people sketch this as a divide right, that's really you know, befuddling or troubling that more, more Israeli Jews support Trump and more American Jews oppose him. But it makes perfect sense because um, Trump affects Israel in a foreign policy sense, right? And Trump affects American Jews in a domestic policy sense. And Trump's domestic policies are, I think, objectively terrible. I think most American Jews think they're objectively terrible. So of course, we don't want to be governed by Trump. We want him gone. He's bad for us, right? But most of the stuff that he's doing here is not doing over there, right? He's just saying we're going to move the embassy to Jerusalem, which is something that the majority of the American Congress voted for overwhelmingly many times, and many American presidents promised to do, and largely isn't a problem as long as you also acknowledge that Palestinians will have a future capital in Jerusalem, right? Which is the thing he didn't do, right? But that's that, that specific thing. And he didn't, you know, uh, watch what, and he sort of stopped the Iran deal, which is still going on anyway. Um, and uh, just pointing out they're still in the deal, right? Which shows that the deal is good for Iran, and Iran's going to stick in the deal. Um, but these sorts of things, so on a foreign policy perspective, is, as Israel, Israelis define their interests, Trump is good for them, right? And they're not thinking about, right, what goes on in other places. That's how most countries react. They judge you by your foreign policy, and we judge our leaders by how they govern us. And often those things are at odds, right? And that's just gonna be normal, and that's true. I don't find it insanely troubling um, I do think that if American Jews and Israeli Jews actually understood each other, had a much better dialogue, those needles would move a bit, right? Because then uh, Israeli Jews would understand just how despairing Trump's presidency has made so many American Jews and how it goes so much against our core values, and they would respect that, and that would affect the posture of the Israeli government. It wouldn't change their foreign policy, but it would change the photo ops, and it would change certain things that they said. And it's really, really, quite frankly, you know, very deeply troubling to see Netanyahu, who does speak English and is capable of accessing that stuff, unlike most of the Israeli public, which isn't and doesn't have the time to do it, and it's not really their business. They rely on him to do it. They outsource it to him, and he doesn't care, right? And he is serving them poorly in this respect. Um, and at the same time, American Jews would listen to Israelis and discover, like, we have X, Y, and Z security concerns, and those are true no matter whether you have Trump as president or anybody else, and those things are important to us too, and that would be a healthier dialogue, and that's something we should work for. Barry, response, uh, closing remarks, whatever moves you. Yeah. <laughs> I don't cook here. Um, I don't know. I've, with regard to Trump, I mean, I've said it before, but I just feel so strongly about it, which is just that Jews have never done well by fellow traveling with bigots whose bigotry just happened to be mostly directed toward other people. And historically aligning ourselves with people that practice the politics of blood and soil does not work out great for us. We're in a really 
difficult moment right now, though, because at least for me, I don't know many people in this room, I feel very politically homeless in this country at the moment. Um, and that's why I think that, you know, if we are feeling that, the Jews have historically been the canary in the coal mine, and if we are feeling sort of politically homeless in the current landscape, it's up to us to sort of recapture um, the common sense and charismatic center. And, and that's really what I am, am focused on. Thank you. Bye, yeah. I feel like somebody should talk to the corrupt Palestinian leaders. Um, I have no problem. I think the question was, how come uh, you know, Congress people can't admit it? I have no problem admitting it. I doubt any of you guys have problems admitting it. It's a huge problem. It's terrible. Imagine how awful it is for the Palestinians. who <laughs> Those are their representatives. It's horrific. Um, but what an awful note to end on. Let us somebody say something else. <laughs> Well, I will say one interesting thing, which is that I was working with a young mother in Gaza on this op-ed, and she said to me, uh, Barry, it's like I'm occupied twice. I'm occupied by Israel, and I'm occupied by Hamas. Yeah, and I've she has since uh, fled Gaza, interestingly. Oh, good. Um, so, okay, that doesn't take us to a happy No, 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 no. I'll, I'll say one more I'll thing. Do, I'll, I'll say one more. I do want to say one more thing. Um, I, I think, um, you know, on the topic of intersectionality, I just want to say, I think it's very important that we recognize that, you know, obviously, like, not all Jews are white, and um, I often will look to black Jews, uh, you know, as uh, for leadership, and because they really are at the intersection of so many systems of oppression, they get forgotten a lot in our discussions about our privilege. And when I find myself in difficult situations, struggling to understand something, I will call upon them and say, "What? how do you see this? Because I think that their point of view in terms of their leadership in our community is really important and we should all be paying a lot more attention to, to Jews of color in, this, in our country and in our communities. So I'll take, um, I'll take the last hopeful words, which is to say that, um, our, our panelists here, I think, have shown us um, that we can really have a nuanced conversation and um, speak across some matter of difference and learn um, in a way that is uh, civil and constructive for us. And I hope that we can all continue um, to do that. And, and this is, as you guys have heard, um, the first in a three-part panel. So we'll be doing that lots more. And tonight, um, IPF Atid members who are here are going to be continuing the conversation downstairs. Um, so with that, I just really want to thank our panelists. I, I wish we had more time and pass this over to David. Thank you again all for coming. I, I think I said to uh, uh, one of the organizers, if I wasn't on the panel, I wouldn't have come. So I'm really impressed and thank you all for being here so we're not talking to an empty room. Thank you. Uh, all, all of you, I've been saying for weeks how uh, excited I was for this panel, and I'm, I'm glad that you all felt that this was the kind of panel that it was worth trudging through snow and rain to be here. Uh, thank you so, so very much. Uh, I want to thank uh, everyone uh, at the ADL, Shia Lerner, Sharon Nazarian in particular, and our staff as well, Adam Bassiano, uh, Sarah baird -Darren. Uh, and everyone, as, as, uh, as Adina mentioned, uh, IPF Atib will be meeting downstairs in the Wise Hall, and I hope you all will be meeting here once again uh, on January 31st when we will dig more deeply into the political divides regarding Israel on wa in Washington between Democrats and Republicans and whether those divides um, can be uh, uh, diminished or, 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 or crossed in, in the periods, uh, period to come. Uh, thank you all once again. Uh, I could hear you guys really all night. Uh, and if you guys are up for it, we should continue backstage. Uh, <laughs> thank you all once again, and I look forward to seeing you again. Yeah.